Healthcare at home. The reason we're doing a panel on healthcare at home is because, as everybody in this room knows, we're kind of in a strange period in a transition from pay for service <coughs> to value based care. And there are a lot of uh, providers and insurance companies out there trying to figure out what to do. How do they, how do they limit cost while improving service, while improving care? And while just a few years ago, the idea of being given healthcare services at home would have been a, a VIP level service that only you know, would be available to the wealthy. Today, because of new technologies, it's becoming something that in the near future is gonna be a standard. And actually the providers and the insurance companies are looking at healthcare at home services as a way to reduce costs, as, as a cost saving mechanism, and also obviously a way to improve outcomes. Um, so what we've done is we've brought together a, a panel. Um, we've got experts here from uh, telemedicine, population health management, uh, patient adherence, uh, remote patient monitoring, uh, and also specialty drugs. So we're going to open up and have a, an interesting discussion about you know, where we think healthcare at home and, and these kinds of services are going to go. So if we can start, Sushil, you want to just Brief introduction. Oh, sure. Uh, Sushil Jain, uh, one of the co-founders, chief revenue officer for Intervene RX, and uh, health economist by training from out west, ran UCLA, and then moved from academia to managed care and never looked back, and one of the few people, I think, who actually uses their graduate degree in real life. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm uh, Eliza Ng. I'm senior medical director at the Montefiore Health uh, System uh, with the care management organization. So we are the... Uh, ACO, population health care management arm of our health systems, which comprises of 11 hospitals and representing over maybe 4,000 physicians. Um, my responsibility includes sort of uh, providing the clinical um, uh, guidance or clinical leadership for managing all our value-based programs, uh, including uh, we are a next-gen ACO, uh, as well as all the bundle payment, oncology care model, all the episodic model payment programs with our health system. So together we manage about 450,000 lives, out of which um, I would say 80 to 90% of those lives are in the government programs area, so Medicare and Medicaid. So what's really relevant for healthcare at home is that uh, we have to um, manage a population that um, are socially and economically uh, and the lower part of the stratum uh, with very little social support and hence poses challenges but also opportunities in terms of helping them getting to the right place uh, at the right time for care. I've got this one. I'm okay. Yeah. yeah. Hi. I'm John Stout. I lead strategy and development at ABLE2. Uh, we are a nationwide tech-enabled uh, telehealth provider. We deliver um, remote services, so either through phone or video, uh, for people who suffer from chronic medical disease and also have a corresponding uh, increase in their levels of depression and anxiety. We've got pl health plan partners who we work with to proactively identify and engage those members, um, and 100% of our care is delivered at home. So really excited to be on the panel. Thanks. Uh, my name's John Lochnane. I work at a group called Commonwealth Care Alliance and serve as Chief of Innovation for Commonwealth Care Alliance and also for our Venture Accelerator, Witcher Street Ventures. Um, I am in a unique position. Commonwealth Care Alliance is a dual eligible integrated healthcare delivery system in Massachusetts for both over 65 and under 65. The over 65 is called Senior Care Options. Under 65 is Integrated Care Organization. Um, we are probably one of the leaders in home-based primary care for complex populations in the country. We've been doing this since 2004. And my daily um, responsibilities will be late tonight when I'm on call, sending a community paramedic out to someone's home to give IV antibiotics, to seeing patients at home, caring for them at the end of life, um, to, uh, to literally thinking about how our innovations work and how to take your good ideas and our good ideas to impact our own population and to scale them to others to improve health care, especially for the most vulnerable populations in the U.S. Great. Uh, my name is Pete Claggett. I'm the CEO at MyMeds. You know, heard me talk a little bit earlier. So we're a digital health company focused on medication adherence and really helping people uh, stay adhered to their medications, get the value out of those medications. Um, 
I've been in the pharmaceutical care space for 20 plus years, big pharma, anthem companies, prime therapeutics, leading organizations. And um, I made a move to this company, MyMed, because I saw a huge opportunity really to change how medication adherence is being managed um, and utilizing digital tools and really involving pharmacists more in the care of patients. So they're, they're not as uh, utilized as they need to be. Uh, so I'm really happy to be here because I think that what we're talking about oftentimes is about care in the home, keeping people out of institutional care and making sure they can take care of themselves, but with that team around them to be successful. So looking forward to it. Thank you. Great. Hi, I'm Julie. Uh, I'm with Data Art. And uh, as you can hear from my accent, I'm from the UK office uh, in London. And I've been in healthcare for about 20 years. I worked for J&J &J for 10 um, and then worked with a number of digital health startups, um, venture capitalists, advisory, um, and now working with Data Art. So I hopefully can give you a perspective for the UK market during the discussion. Right, thanks, Julie. So let's start off with population health management. And, and Eliza, obviously at Montefiore, you guys are, are focused on population health management, but there are a lot of, as you mentioned before, kind of social and economic barriers to actually getting out and, and reaching into the community. What are you guys doing to actually engage with, with, the, with the community and, and how are you seeing those barriers come up? How are you addressing that? Okay, so so first of all, you know, I think there are multitude of barriers. So maybe at the patient level, I talked about sort of some of the barriers around socioeconomics condition. So for us, um, a lot of our programs around keeping patients at home, um, and we face a lot of barriers. For instance, uh, unsafe work environment, home environment, uh, unclean home environment. For instance, so I'll give you an example. We had uh, launched a telemedicine or tele monitoring program, to, you know, for post CHF discharges. Unfortunately, uh, what we've learned is that um, the device, half of the device, couldn't get to the patient's house because it gets stolen when it was mm -hmm. delivered at their um, door, and another quarter of the patients can't use that pro, you know, program and because they didn't have the right um, wireless infrastructure, right? So these are very tactical but real uh, problems for us in terms of um, deploying technologies and solutions to patients at home. So what we do, again, in our population, a lot of times is pretty high touch, right? Our at-home program really focuses on face-to-face -face, um, contacts, and, and so, but the problems is A, it's expensive. We can't really scale it. So as we are as a health system, for instance, moving uh, geographically to a much bigger region, we do face the challenge of what do we do? The other barrier I think it's really important is that, um, and I think I want to emphasize, emphasize that, um, maybe unlike your model, we are a health delivery system with 11 acute care hospitals. So what does that mean? And even though we have about 30% to 40% of our care under value-based framework, it's not the majority. So what it means is we still, as a whole, need to fill our beds to cover our operating expenses. So we're totally aligned as a health system, but you know we have to be cognizant of the fact that not everyone within our health system is has the same agenda, and that's, that's always a, a tension, and I think it's a healthy one. But without recognizing those, though, it, it's really hard, right, to, for us to kind of deploy our innovation or programs to, to reach our patients. So I'll comment, too. I mean, the buzzword is social determinants, and, and social determinants is really filling human needs before you concentrate on health, and I think, as you do, it's high touch, it's longitudinal relationships, and you may actually spend six to nine months simply just helping someone get to a level where they can concentrate on their health. So I think that one of the real growth factors in, in, in startups and other things is just to look at the touches with community-based organizations and others to really have a better stratification of what social determinants. Is it food? Is it housing? Is it touches with the criminal justice system so that when these patients are then um, enrolled in either Montefiore or, or us, that we can have a first understanding of what their needs are instead of going out and always recreating a, a wheel. The other thing I will also point out, which you also do too, is we rely on community health workers and social workers, and it's not a doc-centric model. Mm -hmm. 
you know, I'm the least important person on that team, unless there's a really specific clinical issue. But this is about uh, interprofessional care teams that are doing what they need to in the patient's house in the context of the cultural reality of where the patient is as they define it. So, so Pete, I'm just wondering, um, with, with your system, <coughs> while you obviously have services beyond the technology, the technology seems to be kind of center within your solution. So how are you dealing with these kinds of uh, social and economic determinants? Yeah, I think it's, it's really important. So we created a platform initially that was well, web-based, uh, and then we created our mobile apps, if you will. And what we found is that there's a, a broad spectrum of people, both on, on a socioeconomic basis, uh, but also on their tech savviness basis. And mm -hmm. actually, a third, which is their disease condition, that allows some people to not be able to utilize a smartphone. So, so even though we talk about having digital technology, mobile technology as, as really great, some people just can't use those things. The, if, if they have diabetic neuropathies, they, they can't see as well. If they have rheumatoid arthritis, their dexterity goes. They need to use a larger screen or a keyboard. So there's reasons for having those different devices. But at the same time, we're talking about underserved population, perhaps in Medicaid or Medicare, Medi Medi populations, for instance. The one thing they do have is a smartphone. Mm. They may not have a desktop, so but they do have a smartphone. And even if it's, you know, my parents, oops, I'm still on. <coughs> Even if it's the grandparents, that's how they communicate with their kids, with texting, mm -hmm. or pardon me, the grandchildren. So there are ways to get there. We're not all the way there. But having a device that's ubiquitous uh, really does help. So Sushil, mm -hmm. what about you? I mean, uh, as far as, uh, again, you're similar to Pete. You have a lot of technology involved. I mean, do you use different routes to engage with, with the patients? What, what's the strategy, uh, Intervene Rx? Yeah, so, um, you know, Liza mentioned some really uh, critical core problems of just technology and engagement from the start. We, we sort of didn't start off by saying, oh, we're going to ship all this stuff to you and it's going to just work, <clears> right? We actually do an underwriting survey telephonically or in-home with the patient, and that sets up the training level for that specific patient. Everything from home care-based community network that we partnered with to set it up in the patient's home, including you know the Wi-Fi it's, uh, or store and forward if they're not connected. To if somebody's savvy, like perhaps you know many of us, you know just look at the YouTube video on on the download of the Google uh, Play Store app or the uh, uh, Apple Store app, right? And so we try and do that sort of match of training to individuals' uh, ability to engage with the whole technology environment and their Wi-Fi environment. The other piece is we involve stakeholders, uh, both the family and the doctor. That's not uh, you know, solving everything that some of the folks here talked about, but oftentimes there are influencers on that patient uh, in terms of engagement. Certainly they, are, they tend to listen more to their prescriber or doctor, and so when they know that you know, we're acting on behalf of and connecting with their provider regarding their cystic fibrosis or hep C or whatever uh, critical condition they may have, Hopefully, we find them more receptive to be engaged. But you know, I think to Pete's point earlier, there's enough research out there that one and you know the the presenter before on the artificial intelligence. You know, eventually you can start to codify algorithmically how to be able to engage mm -hmm. more optimally every patient specific to their environment. And you know, we're not there yet, uh, but certainly those are things that could be coming. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, John, you, uh, John Stout, you had earlier mentioned that you provide a telemedicine services through telephone and also video, right? So I'm, I'm just wondering, how, how, how do you see the split between the two? I mean, is video being adopted quickly? Is telephone service, you know, the bulk of the work? Uh, you know, because again, it, it kind of runs into the same issue of, you know, are people actually technology enabled? Are they going to be able to, you know, have a, a telemedicine virtual chat with you? Yeah. The, um, when I first heard of the able to solution when I was on the plan side, my hypothesis was that um, the efficacy of the video treatment would be a lot better than the telephonic delivery. Um, I, I'm not a clinician. I don't know why I thought that. It, was, it just seemed to make sense to me. Um, but what I've learned now kind of being on the inside is that the, the data doesn't support that. In fact, the majority of the patients we treat today still prefer the phone as opposed to video treatment. Um, again, we deliver therapy, right? So it's cognitive behavioral therapy delivered remotely. Um, 
in my completely non-clinical opinion of why that is, I think dealing with this stigma of behavioral health, um, people still like that telephone, right? And it could be a smartphone, but it doesn't have to. It could be an old rotary phone in their house, right? It's, it's totally up to them. Um, but they, they like the ability to, if they want to um, have the perception of um, being anonymous, even though you know, the, the therapist knows their name and their member ID number and um, is, is taking clinical notes, um, we, study, we study it like crazy whether the, the it, clinical outcomes move uh, more effectively on video versus the telephone. And what we see is almost no difference. Uh, interesting. So, Julie, what about in, uh, in the UK, the NHS? I mean, how are they handling similar issues? So, I think for everyone that knows the NHS, the kind of the key thing to remember is that it, the treatment is free at the point of care. Um, so, our system is extremely different to the one that you have in the States. Um, but the challenge around that is the expectation of the patient is completely different. So, they just expect everything to be done and delivered and available. And the mechanism, the current system, doesn't facilitate funding for reimbursement for any kind of innovative home care system. So, we have a system in the NHS called Healthcare at Home. Um, and if you look at it, it's predominantly um, a drug delivery service. So it's not really healthcare at home, right? So um, there are amazing technologies and the um, NHS has a, an innovation accelerator. So it used to be the innovation center where they look at innovations that will transform in the next five years, the NHS and provision of care. Um, and the NHS does a lot of work to try and kind of create a community around bringing innovation and um, ideas and change but the fundamental issue is um, most of the hospitals are heading towards bankruptcy like mildly controversial but <laughs> they're spending too much money we have like everyone an aging population they're firefighting um, so doing things that are in the five-year plan which is about prevention um, early intervention and management of long-term conditions. They're all great sound bites, but <coughs> unfortunately the funding just isn't available at the moment. And only last week they've just introduced an option to accelerate your uh, primary care appointment if you pay for it, which is a huge move in the NHS. Um, so I envisage in the future that there will be an option to self-pay um, for certain services, which will be a massive breakthrough, I think, for anything healthcare at home. But in the current NHS system, it's just not feasible for them to deliver. Uh, so when, when I think of healthcare at home, <coughs> the, the first thing that comes to mind, for me at least, as a, a technologist, is telemedicine. But then after that, I, I think about actually community paramedicine. Because, you know, this idea of a kind of a SWAT team going out there and taking care of people. And, and John, I had seen a, a quick video of, of uh, on YouTube of you guys where you put this together and the patients were just extremely thankful because some people just simply aren't able to get up and go to the, to the provider's office, go to the hospital. T tell us a little bit about community paramedicine. Sure. So um, we were always based as an as a intensive home intervention primarily with NPs and physicians like myself that would go to patients' homes. A lot of our patients have severe physical disability or other challenges. These are the spinal cord injury, some events, uh, CP, muscular dystrophy. And what we realized was is that we did a great job between about 8 and 7 at night. But after 7, we went back to what most providers have is just that either go to the ER or wait till the next morning. So we had the opportunity to um, do a pilot through Mass Department of Public Health and OEMS where we kind of changed what paramedics did. And we now are about 1,700 runs into this. It started in October of 2014, where as tonight, um, a physician and nurse practitioner will be on call like myself. And for specific patients, either who are identified today or will call in tonight, we have the ability to have a community paramedic under our medical control go out and do a number of interventions and not necessarily have to bring the patient to the ER. And those interventions include pretty high level um, IVs, IV Lasix diuretics, IV uh, narcotics like fentanyl and other for pain because we do a lot of end of life with our community paramedics, IV antibiotics. The whole realm of most drugs that you would need to treat uh, immediate issues. They can also do labs through an ISTAT machine. They can get an EKG that's transmitted to our 
phones. They can do basically everything a New York can to some degree except x-rays. And it's been a tremendously well-accepted pilot in Massachusetts now, I think because of this and another pilot, community power medicine is going to have regulations to allow it across Massachusetts. But it was really based on creating, there was a gap that we had where we couldn't provide care in the home. Mm -hmm. So we thought of a different way of doing this. And to go to your other point, you know, when we think about how to care for patients, we believe in voice. I believe in voice, that's how we communicate. But patients, we stratify into when a telephone call or voice can happen or when you need physical presence. And so um, the community power medicine fit into our, uh, our physical presence. And we think that each patient needs a menu of options of care mm -hmm. that you then can leverage to what their need is in the home. And community power medicine is one of ours. Now, is it covered? So, so we are, so this is an interesting question because we're a risk adjusted capitated okay. plan. We, were, uh, we had the, the flexibility to do this. One of the challenges of community power medicine will be funding in a fee-for-service yeah. world, but you can imagine we have a white paper on this that we put together. In a capitated area where you keep someone from going to the ER or hospital, that's value. Yeah. So I think that some of these programs are based out of financial alignment. Mm -hmm. And I think home-based care is a perfect example where financial alignment with complex, costly populations, there is an ROI. Liza, you're going to say something? No, I was going to ask John about that because we, we in New York, for instance, are, I mean, we, we've been very interested in this um, uh, and, and has, has had a hard time getting it started because 80% of all ED or e, EMS visits are, are with FITNI. Uh, which is a city-based ambulance. So, so some political ramifications, why we couldn't get off the ground. So I think it's interesting because it sounds like you, you own your own, um, you have your own transportation company that can actually do that, we, So, which makes it easier. For yeah, sure. we partnered, but we had to go through a process to change how paramedics practiced in Massachusetts under the pilot, which now hopefully will be statewide. But I do not want to underestimate the challenge that that is, but I think that what we have seen is patients, patients' engagement of this is overwhelming, and I think that could really help drive it, and that's the last thing I'll say about this is, if it's good for patients, when you do the triple aim, having a, have a higher quality patient satisfaction is a huge element in all the other aspects of the quadruple aim. So, so when we look at healthcare at home, whether it's telemedicine, whether it's uh, community paramedicine, um, the other day, Julie and I were talking, and she's like, well, it'll, it'll obviously cannibalize the services that are provided from the, from the hospital. And, you know, if we were all in a capitated model, um, that would be fine because we would potentially be being move, moving the care to a lower cost <coughs> area. But since some hospitals and healthcare systems are not in a, a, a uh, value-based kind of model yet, how is it actually impacting the, the industry, uh, Montefiore, or do you guys... Are you guys seeing a struggle internally for people thinking about adopting these, but <clears throat> let's not do it yet, let's wait until we're forced to go to a capitated model or, or, or some other value-based model, or, or are you seeing people adopt it now? Well, I mean, I'll start. I mean, at the end of the day, you have to really look at what is this about, right? If it's about patient care, it's about quality. And so the dialogue always, while financial alignment is critical but the dialogue to me has always had needs to start from what is the quality of care mm -hmm. right so if we are as a health system are not providing um, an optimum quality of care we've got a problem and we need to fix it um, fortunately in in something like the model that we talked about there's also this whole readmissions penalty and we know that CMS <coughs> is coming more and more down the pike with penalty right this is mm -hmm. not just value-based care anymore it's more like if you don't do this you're gonna care. Right, so and macro and MIPS, um, while that's more of an outpatient component, but I think it's all alignment now. Like in, in five years' time, whether you're a physician or hospital system, if you don't do the right thing, I believe, I mean, you're going to not get paid as much as your peers. So this is a pie that is in some ways zero-sum game, and you, you either play or you don't play. So that's sort of my perspective. I agree. I think we're in an interesting time of transition where hospitals are, are still in a fee-for-service heads on beds model, but they know that things may change, mm -hmm. but things have, may have changed for a while now. Um, so I think we're in a waiting period. What I will say is that I think for these great technological ideas, one of the ideas that I would offer 
is I spend a lot of my career as a hospitalist, and I really think when we're figuring out what happens with that is to look at the transitions of care. So let's say I have a patient who's diagnosed with hep C who I need to make sure takes their, their medications. That should happen at discharge as the hospitalist. And so often, whether in, my, in the office or when I'm doing my hospitalist gig, there's a real opportunity for technology improvement to impact the patient upon discharge. And so often it's seven days later or 10 days later and the momentum is left. So I actually think including the acute care um, place of, of, of treatment and then thinking about a technology discharge plan mm -hmm. as well as a medication discharge plan and the home care discharge plan is an opportunity to really meld and move things into more of a value-based technologically driven solution. Can, can I just chime in there for, for sure. a sec? Right. So um, I, I love everything you guys are saying, and I think um, just thinking back to conversations I've had in a prior role sitting across from hospitals negotiating managed care contracts, and um, I think they say every, all the right things, right? And, and we understand models are moving there, but at the end of the day, there's still a crane in the parking lot, right, for a new uh, uh, expansion that's being built. Um, and those improvements in the discharge planning, which I, agree, I think are the absolute key to this transformation. I, I sat across from the CMO of a, of a very large hospital system when we put him and his system on a value-based reimbursement contract and we represented over 50% of the commercial market and, and it was our entire population. So this was a really big deal. And he said, you know, up to this point, we had been solely <coughs> focused on length of stays, right, and getting people out of our beds, right, or getting out of Somewhere. our rooms, right? And we've been agnostic as to what happens to them once they leave, right? And if I need to get somebody out the door, the quickest thing for me to do is pick up my phone and call a SNF, right, a skilled nursing facility, and get them shipped over there because that SNF is going to send an ambulance right to my front door and, and take them to that SNF. I don't care if it costs the system more. They're out of my hospital, right? And he knew, obviously, very, very smart person, he knew that, that that patient wanted to be cared for at home, that the care would be better for him at home. It would be better for the whole family if having that person at home. But guess what? It's like seven phone calls that he's got to make. And he's got to make sure the oxygen tank's there. And <coughs> he's going to have somebody to take him for his medication and for his follow-up visit. It's just the coordination of that is hard, right? I mean, that's that's it's been a major barrier. So to the extent that those financial incentives aren't in place, it's hard for me to imagine, imagine this kind of change happening at scale. Yeah. So well, Pete or Sushil, I mean, are, are you guys seeing kind of this pushback from, from these, these systems that can help patients at home? Or I mean, or even who's willing to pay for them, right? I mean, who's, who's the actual buyer? Who's, and then for the buyer, how are you convincing them that they're actually gonna save money and not lose money if it's, you look at a provider? you know, who's still in a fee-for-service plan. Uh, I'll start, I guess. So I see as, as the payers that, that we're dealing with and talking to, they <coughs> want a solution that manages this issue on discharge to make sure, because one of the main reason, I mean, you guys can tell me, your clinicians, not me, but the main reason people come back, come back in the door is medication misadventures, right? One of them. One of them, <laughs> right? One of the major reasons, right? So. How can we actually get the data, make sure that when somebody's leaving on discharge, they understand why they're taking all the medications that are now being put on. Someone comes in, has an MI, now they're putting on some new medications. How do you make sure they, they understand that? So when they get home and put their medications on the counter in their kitchen, they haven't forgotten why they're taking those. And that's, that becomes the problem. It's that education aspect. So how can we educate them? And through whether it's digital technologies or other aspects, I think we can get there and solve that and prevent some of those readmissions. So I think everyone wants to make it happen, it's just we haven't made all those connections yet. Well, I, you know, John already told me no uh, to our solution on Friday, <laughs> so that's so why I'm sitting over here and not next to him. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> so we've actually had some great conversations with health systems, uh, but they are far more complex from my view, after being at Anthem and many other health plans, and even at Geisinger, a spinoff, than, you know, A, You've got, you know, uh, a very bureaucratic decision-making process in health systems. I would say, you know, that's one experience. Number two, physician champions that I think panels talked about earlier often don't have the budgets, right? The departments, <laughs> right? In fact, the money is over at the CIO who's implementing an $800 million epic switch, right? So 
chasing where the decision makers are versus chasing where the funds are. And of course, every health system, you know, the last question and uh, throw is a barrier. Do you integrate with Cerner or Epic or Allsuite, right? So as you know, and which, which EMR integrates with anything, <coughs> right? At, at the data layer, sure. Even, yeah, they can't even do it at the CDA level, let alone at the data layer. Hmm. So uh, these are solvable things, right? But uh, I'm actually impressed when you, when you look at the landscape of what's going on with health systems and, uh, and progression and innovation. And it doesn't have to be under value-based care. Because these solutions, these home, I think you know the the CFOs and other executives like these folks are going to see that there's an operating arbitrage that's of value, right? Margin improvement, yeah, period. Yeah, yeah. So. yeah. yeah. Okay. and increasingly, I mean, we we are very attracted to vendors or partners who are willing to put themselves at risk, right? So so it becomes more of a partnership than a transactional relationship. Um, it, it's just attractive to us because we don't have a lot big budget, and so if you're willing to put your resources at risk, at least partial at risk, that, that just makes it easier for us to, to create that value proposition for, the, for our CFO, for instance. Is that for a pilot, Eliza? <laughs> <laughs> so I love intervening our ex, but as we said, it's just, you know, and someone said it earlier, you have to be very careful about which pilots you aim into which population. So when you said about the med medical adherence, both of us said part of it. Because we know there's other components of what happens. So when I think about my patients, um, and we did a pilot before we did community paramedicine, we did a discharge pilot where we sent EMTs home to see patients at time of discharge. So the EMT would see the patient at Boston Medical Center go to their home. Literally, the first 50 patients, 48, the meds we thought they were on weren't the meds they were on. Um, most of the time, they didn't have food. Um, we, we realized right then and there what our focus needed to be was on, on, on other things so we could get to those other solutions. So I really think that the discharge, when you think about home care and you think about technology embedding in it, think about it as holistic. It's almost a, ch a checklist or the, the triad of, 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 of human need. And then once you get to the point where things are pretty stable, I think then technology can be tremendously helpful. And I think it can be tailored pretty early, but I do really get concerned with early p technology, and I've done it myself, putting into populations that just aren't ready for that level of intervention at that moment. Julie? So it's just to, um, to add on to your point that, um, and I've used this quote a few times, so I apologize to my data art colleagues, but um, in the UK, we see a lot of companies, and I see a lot of companies, uh, digital health companies that have unbelievable solutions. But the, the quote is, it's like um, creating Rolls Royces for a system that can only really deal with a lawnmower at the moment. And so why are you making it so complicated and sophisticated when actually the solution just needs to be really basic? And the so what factor, how are you really going to make a difference? Um, they often kind of miss. So. So in, to, to stay with the UK for a second, um, you know, what I heard everybody else say here was that, you know, one of the areas that we should focus on is, you know, educating the patient at discharge, uh, reducing the chance of readmittance. And while doing things like healthcare at home may not be most ideal in a single payer system like, like in the UK, what about things that would actually lower costs for the whole system, like medication adherence systems, like, you know, like, education to the patient. Is, is that happening? Um, we're actually working on projects, <laughs> looking at doing exactly that in the UK market. Um, yes, it would absolutely help. Um, I think that the challenge is around who the payer is um, and whether the patients themselves, the, the change in behaviour to embrace um, or understand that, that spending money and enhancing their own well-being um, and not relying on the state so much. And there's kind of a big change, I think, coming within the NHS system. But absolutely, you know, innovations will transform patient cares and, and, and outcomes. Um, it's just politically, it's quite a um, hot potato or nightmare, whichever way you want to look at it. So what, what about, uh, you always hear about the com commercialization of healthcare where you know, the patient is now actually getting the choice, who am I going to be cared for? Am I going to go to the, the psychologist down the street? Am I going to go to Able To? Am I going to go to the hospital? 
you know, and, and they're the ones now who are potentially making the decision. Um, do you actually see a, a changeover where the patient is actually going to drive the adoption of, of, of these different technologies because they're simply not going to go to the providers who are not technology enabled? And if so, have you actually seen any current real world instances of that? Can I just, sorry, just jump in. So there was a paper published in May um, coming out of Norway um, that looks at adoption of digital health solutions. Um, and essentially it's saying that um, one, people don't understand technology, which we've touched on. Um, two, um, they like a Fitbit. So you'll use your Fitbit for three months and put it in the bin. So they get excited and then they can't be bothered anymore. So adherence, again, is a problem. Um, and although it's costly and no one in the digital world likes to admit it, the whole face-to-face -face piece, like hands-on contact, people want that. If you go into your doctor and you're going to talk about, you know, either your rash or your, you know, whatever it is you've got, you want someone to look at it and touch it and make you feel like, you know, you're not just another face on a TV screen. Um, and so for those reasons, um, they're seeing a decline in the adoption of digital health solutions. So it's just something that you have to be mindful of, I think. With Any, Anybody else have anything to add? If you don't mind, John, yeah. Um, that's why um, we've seen, for instance, um, First World Congress on Medication Adherence in 2012 said everybody needs to create these digital solutions, go out and create apps. So money rushed in, people did that. The following year in 2013, they came back together and said, all right, you built all the things, but no one's using them. Why is that? <coughs> and so we realized that a digital solution on its own really isn't the solution. You do have to have that personal touch, that, that human touch that's part of the solution. We can extend care um, through digital means, but that's not the end all for care. So it's that combination, I think, ultimately where we're going to land is, is having the ability to be more cost efficient and maybe more uh, a broader reach and frequency of contact with patients between uh, their annual visits. But you still need to have that personal touch. So, so how far away is that, that future? I, you know, I, I imagine this future we're going to be in where you know, I come home from work and I step into my house and the house goes, well, Dan, it looks like you had a hard day today. Let me put on you know, some soft music, dim the lighting. By the way, you haven't been sleeping well. Would you like us to set up an appointment with your general practitioner to see how, you know, to, to get a checkup? And, and I'm like, yes, Alexa, please do that. You know, how long before we're there? So we have a pilot right now with Alexa at GOES uh, through Center for Healthcare Strategies trying to figure out some of those questions. But to, to tell that, I think what it is, when I see, it's funny because I think that the, the the real role of technology, and I think the real potential is, is partnered with a primary care provider that you have a relationship with, and you have enough time during that interaction to plan how you're going to do this together. So I think it's a hybrid. And I think primary care in 20 years is going to be a hybrid of in-person and technological engagement that the patient determines what it is. So I think that right now we kind of run technology in this silo and primary care in that silo. And I think ultimately, if let's say you had every primary care doctor in the United States with an hour to see each patient, I think you'd see a substantial change in how healthcare is delivered, and I think you'd see a substantial improvement in how we utilize these wonderful technological solutions. So I agree. I mean, as an ACO, our, premier, our primary strategies are uh, around managing transitions of care and what I call uh, tetherness to the primary care, because mm -hmm. we deeply believe that primary care has is the critical role, foundational role of population health management. So many of our um, initiatives are around how do we use whether it's technology or a different care team to get patients as connected to their primary care as possible. So we look for solutions that could complement our, our solutions, which is primary care connectivity, and not really using technology to drive our workflow, if you may. I have a point of view on that, too. I mean, I think the technology will be there, no doubt. Um, I think it will be 20 plus years, right, before people actually want to use it. I mean, just a, a funny story from uh, a couple of weeks ago. I mentioned in the panel this morning, I just had my third child, and we switched. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, we switched primary care physicians. We summit, I live in New Jersey. We summit medical group, which is often kind of referred to as like the premier you know, uh, physician organization in New Jersey, went for the primary care visit, 
um, by the time I got to my car after the visit, um, I had an email that was a summary of the clinical notes from my visit. And I, I you know, was in the car with my wife. I was like, wow, look at that. We got a PDF of our note. I didn't even open it. Right? I didn't do anything with it. But I remarked, like, wow, that's, that's really interesting that they sent this to me. Um, yet every other transaction you have in life, like that would not be exceptional at all, right? You buy, you go to the ATM and you can have your receipt emailed to you, right? You yeah. buy something at Dick's Sporting Goods and they're, they're emailing you, right? Like it's, in all other facets of life, it's just commonplace, but in healthcare, for whatever reason, people don't even seem to want can the I, technology. Can yeah. I suggest that the reason is because of the confidentiality and, and the nature of the information? So, um, you know, it's something that most people will want to keep very private yeah. um, and don't want to... I mean, even that change in behavior of kind of giving that information requires a kind of a step change in people's expectations. So I suspect that would be... Probably, especially in behavioral health, yeah. right? Absolutely. Yeah, so um, I'm sorry, but... We, we should open up uh, questions to the audience because we're, we're coming to the end of the panel. Um, if you have questions, please raise your hand over there. Hello, thanks. And you have to tell us who you are, remember? Oh, uh, Juliana Kim, affiliated with NYU and Univision. So uh, I have a question regarding, with all this technology, um, do you see price transparency when it comes to healthcare coming through anytime soon? Because I think that's exactly what you were saying, was any, any other discipline or service that you buy, you know beforehand what you're paying for. And in this case, with healthcare, traditionally you don't know when you go in what an exam costs, what your x-rays cost, et cetera. Yeah, I can answer that, at least from the pharmacy world. So uh, we're actually working on an integration today with an entity that does provide the benefit level pricing for medications at any given location. Do a GPS map, you know, your Google map, what store is close to you, what's it cost for this medication here versus there, lets you understand that. And that's real time connected with your benefits. So if you have a deductible, um, you have co-payments or co-insurance, all that's calculated real time. It's like a, a mini adjudication, if you will, it happens real time. So that is absolutely going to happen in the pharmacy space. It's starting to happen, and I think it'll become more ubiquitous. Um, I don't know about other aspects of healthcare, but certainly in pharmacy that's happening. Can I fly the flag for the UK? Sure. So we have a system where it's completely transparent. You know exactly the costs and what you're paying for. So. Um, it's been a real education for me being here today to understand actually the NHS is pretty cool. So, huh. thanks. <laughs> um, did we have a question over there or no? Hi, my name is Will Treichler with HIG Employee Benefits. Um, question is kind of around generational differences or gaps. Um, so, you know, specific to, uh, I think I really look at it through the lens of able to, um, but when you were talking about being able to see the difference between uh, somebody on the telephone or somebody on a WebEx, for lack of a better term, um, are you able to stratify that into age bands and see any uh, differences between those ages? And also, you know, for the rest of the panelists, similar uh, type of theme, do you guys see differences in the adoption rates or, you know, how effective the tools are um, with different types of people based on age class? Yeah, so, so we stratify that, that sweet spot of, of who we treat, which are, you know, those with chronic medical conditions and an underlying behavioral health uh, disorder, usually stress or anxiety. And uh, the results are, are online with what you'd expect, right? Younger folks, we don't treat those under 18, right? But the younger cohort that we do see will have a higher adoption of our tools. Right, of, our, of our technology that supports somebody throughout treatment and higher utilization of the video chat as opposed to uh, the telephone. But it's not, I don't have the specific stats off the top of my head, but it's not as drastic as you would think. I, I agree. One of the things we've learned with the Echoes too is it's motivation for you to use the device and using devices that are already flowing into their everyday experience. So if the Echo can play you your favorite music list and you want to listen to it, and it can order your dog food from Petco, then you may use it for something else. So I think it's it's an embedded everyday flow, and I think we are in a, in a kind of a, a brightening thing where how many echoes are there? Like 15 million echoes out there right now, roughly. So that would be my answer. And we have never seen this idea that folks who are over a certain age aren't going to engage in technology. It's about motivation for the technology. 
But but I would I would cut it differently though too. I, I think you've mentioned right behavioral health. Yes. Um, what you found is that patients are are more willing to engage over the phone versus video. And what we found through our study is uh, even in front of that, um, we found that patients are not very willing to tell their doctors, for instance, about their homelessness status, uh, their behavioral health status, domestic abuse or violence status, uh, as opposed to self-report it, right? So in that, so it's not just, I think, segmentation, which is really critical, don't get me wrong, but also you, you have to think about what is it that you're asking them to do or what is it that you're trying to uncover? Um, because there are areas where patients really whether it's privacy concern or just other, you know, kind of motivational component that they're not as willing to engage technology to interact. And I, I'd add just maybe from, again, from the pharmacy world. So uh, our application, web, um, kind of push notifications through an app, text messaging, we definitely see a difference there. So we did a pilot uh, in a million life health plan where we offered the essentially the email solution or our mobile app. And 100% of those users, average age was 60, chose the web. So it was interesting. We said, why do we spend all this money creating our, our mobile app when everyone's utilizing? But it really did, it was about their comfort level with technology, what they're utilizing. They're already using email, and that's what they wanted to utilize. We do find that younger populations, cystic fibrosis patients who are younger, love using apps. They're more tech savvy, love using tools like that. But we do find the overarching is everyone loves using texting because it's ubiquitous. We use it every day. It's the most read and the most responded to technology today. And so, and we carry it around with us all the time. So we're seeing that more and more so kind of becoming the, I will not say the default, but probably the, the one most often used. We have another question over here. Yeah. Uh, uh, turn it on. Oh, okay, good. Um, I wonder if the panel could, I'm sorry, I'm Brad Picard, I'm an um, independent uh, strategy consultant. Um, I wonder if the panel can address the potential um, repeal of the Affordable Care Act and um, what its effect might be on the, on the home health care market specifically. I mean, a lot of um, you know, the shift towards uh, home health care is driven by uh, say the shift to value-based care, which is driven by Medicare you know, regulations and, and, and so on. Um, if there is a radical um, defunding of Medicaid, if there's a, a fairly significant um, you know, change in the law, um, have you gamed out um, how that would affect your businesses and um, like what are the ways in which um, the shift towards home health care um, you know, would be seen. I realize that's a yeah. For, for it could take another uh, whole day to uh, to explore, but um, so in you know, brief. Just back of the envelope for fun, you know, we did that right, and so we took the CBO data of uh, 24 million less covered. You know, in the current state of what potentially is being floated. Number one, number two, if you wipe away pre-existing uh, as a requirement, right, that particular tranche of business, which is where we play, right, cystic fibrosis, FC, uh, it, affects, it would affect our business dramatically. Now, it doesn't mean that those people are not going to be paid for by somewhere, high-risk pools or whatever else is being floated around to be seen, but on face value, uh, our particular business would be uh, affected pretty significantly. All right. Um, <clears throat> so, w unfortunately, we're running out of time, and like we said, we could go into that for another <laughs> hour. Um, so let's everybody give the panel a round of applause. Thank you, guys and ladies.